Hey, it's Diane Williams coming to you from my studio today. And I'm going to do a little demo on how to create depth in your painting. I got the most interesting email this weekend from a student. How do I make my paintings look like they have more depth? Well, that's a really, really big question. And um, there are so many ways, so many answers to the question. And we have theories about perspective. We have theories about color. Oftentimes they work, oftentimes they don't work. For me, it's a matter of making marks, responding to the marks and seeing where I need to go next. I may put a, a, a white on top of a red and suddenly the red gets pushed into the background. Then I could put a little dot of black over the white and suddenly the, the red and black come back into the foreground, push the white into the background. There's all different kinds of depth in a painting that can be created in all different ways. What I'm demonstrating today is a three panels that I have been working on. They are in the very beginning stages. I have not found my composition yet. I don't think I've necessarily found my color palette yet. So what I'm doing in this video is just pushing and pulling with the paint, working back and forth, trying to see what comes up what pushes back. I'm looking to establish foreground, middle ground, and background, and color relationships. I do, am not, nothing is set in stone on this painting. So um, I'm not worried about what I do. I'm willing to make mistakes later on as I find the composition, as I find the color palette. I'll show you how to really hone in on your composition to really make it sing, to really bring forward what you want to bring forward and push back what you want to push back. Today, it's just about play. It's about play and using my eyes to make some adjustments, to make some decisions, to work together with the paint itself. Okay, so I hope you enjoy it. This is uh, three panels I've been working on. They're just little pieces of birch plywood that I'm working on. I think they're about a half an inch thick. And I always like to work in multiples for many reasons. One of the main reasons is that we can get exciting compositions by moving the multiples around like this. What if I put that there? That's a different composition. And that adds a different element. Let's take the large shape out of the center, put it on one of the sides, see what happens. That's interesting too. And honestly, at this point, it really doesn't matter because I haven't gotten to the point yet that I have found the composition. So this is as good of a place as any to start. And there is some depth in this painting. Uh, it's a fairly flat painting. You can see that the background is white. And the white is not very interesting. It's all pretty much the same. There's not a lot of depth. There's a little bit of depth when you get a little bit of the underpainting here that gets pink. It pushes it back a little bit and the white comes a little forward. So I like to be aware of what comes forward, what's in the mid ground and what's in the far background. The first thing that I notice about this painting is um, it's a little cold to me. It needs a little warmth. So I was thinking of adding a little bit of an off-white color to, to warm this up. So uh, I usually just use lids for my painter's palette. These are lids from 
this is my water bucket today, but this was originally a gesso bucket. I buy it by the gallon. I'm using this for the water and this for the palette. And I want a warm beige -ish color. I think I'm going to start with Titian Buff. Let's get this for our starting point. And to that, I'm going to add a little bit of the transparent yellow iron oxide. This is going to give me a little maybe yellower than I want. I want, might want it a little more beige, but let's start out with the little brighter yellow color and we can always tone it down later. It's a layering process, layer after layer after layer. Don't worry too much about making a mistake because you're just going to go over it and change it anyway. I usually mix my acrylic paint with some gloss medium or matte medium. It extends the pigment, meaning that um, I can use a lot less paint. And it seems to give it a, a type of a translucency that I like as well. Now, what's interesting about paint is that you can change what you've got. I think this large circle just may be a little bit too much for me. Now I can change my mind and go back later, but I'm going to cover part of it up. I'm going to retain part of that line there, uh, and I will continue this color on the other side of the line. I don't even know if you can see that in the camera. Um, and the reason that I'm doing that is to give me a consistent background. Now a shape starts to develop with this red that I like better than the rounded shape. It's more of a petal shape, actually. There's a couple of them going on here, here and here. So suddenly what was a circle becomes two petal shapes. And I'll work with that for a little while. So it's warming it up nicely. I don't like that angle there. I'm gonna cut that off. This is, uh, believe you me, not an exact science. You just don't know what's gonna happen. You just start painting. So many people these days are feeling so insecure because of the isolation and their lack of getting together we're able to get together online uh, on Zoom calls, but it's just not quite the same as being in a class and seeing what everybody's doing. So now I'm going to put some of this color up here to add the background up there. And what I'm kind of doing is isolating the shapes that I have, altering them slightly and just kind of unifying a background that's a little warmer. I didn't mix a whole lot of paint. I'm running a little low, let's see. Now, I'm also the kind of painter that I usually do one color on one palette. So if I switch colors, a lot of times I just switch palettes. Now, here's something I did. I want to get a scraper. There was a shadow that I kind of liked here that I covered up. I can go back, scrape it off with my scraper. Oh, that's nice. Scraped in, got a little white down here, and that's so cool. Maybe I'll see what happens if I scrape a little more of the surface, bring up a little more of that white. That worked out pretty good. Yeah. Now, what if I want to get some more of this beige color down here? I just reapply it. Nice. Over here, we're too cold, too white. I want to come over here. Now, one thing that I like to do is collage, add paper. And I found this piece of paper this morning. I thought, boy, wouldn't this be a nice piece of paper on this. Look at how it just changes the whole 
uh, atmosphere of the painting. This goes over the top of that. Um, I'm building upwards. And this is building it up. The yellow comes closer than the red in this case. We can change that later by going over this area with some red. But for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fasten that down. I quite like that. I'm going to take the polymer medium and I'm going to just pour it down here, spread it around a bit. Then I put this little scrap of paper I found. This is a piece of rice paper that I had put some paint on. And then I'm going to also go over the top of this with my gloss medium. And that'll really adhere it down. Makes it almost one with the board. And um, I think that's pretty interesting. I wish I had a little more of that paper. So what I uh, can do later is I, I keep boxes of paper. I can go through my scraps and say, is there anything else I'd like to put down paper-wise? And I'm sure eventually I will. I have some scraps of black tissue paper. And this is another thing that I like to use and put down. Now this tissue paper should come very much forward. And I don't know if I want quite that much. What I was enjoying about this piece is it, it seems to be florals or fruits. There seems to be some kind of uh, vegetation growing here. So what would happen if I tore the black just to give me an indication of like a stem or something. So do something like that. And I probably have enough medium on my scraper. Put a little bit more down. At this point, I haven't found the composition yet, so I'm not going to worry too much about where I put things because I can always remove them, paint over them, sand into them. But you see what black does? <clears throat> it adds a, a strong element that really is coming forward and it's giving us some contrast, which I'm, I'm loving. Now I'm looking at the reds and they're all pretty dull. I'll take my brush, put it in some water so it doesn't get hard. We are using with acrylics. They tend to harden up pretty quick. Another palette. And this time I want to take my favorite red, which is a cadmium red light. This is a very, very bold color. Okay, now I'm going to start out with a little cadmium, then I'm going to blend it. This color reminds me of a, of a chop mark. So what if I just made some marks on the top of the surface in some kind of a pattern to indicate like a chop mark? In China, chop marks are sort of a signature. You can have a mark made that's specific to you on a stone block and you can use that on your painting as sort of a signature. The interesting thing is other people who bought the painting could add their chop mark on it as well so that you can have a history of the painting where it had been. Now I'm going over the top of this paper which is going to pull this red forward. So this red is forward of this gold. The yellow is, is farther in the background and the whitish color is even farther back. 
So you're beginning to see the separation of space here. It's getting to be a lot more interesting than it was a few minutes ago because the space is getting a lot, a lot more separated. Um, this is very dull here. And I have to decide, do I want a circle quite as large as this one was? And the reason that I'm making this one larger is I don't want all my circles the same size. I want a variation of size. Go over the black a little bit, suddenly the red comes forward to the black. So these are just things to think about as you're creating your depth in your composition. I'm enjoying this shape up here quite a bit and wondering, it's not quite strong enough. There aren't quite enough layers. Well, the painting is a young painting. There aren't a lot of layers on anything. I want to build that area up a bit. Um, I don't think I ultimately want it to be this bright but I could start out with a little brightness in it. Later on, go back over the top and, and tone it down with a deeper color. The red will come through as adding depth, making it a little stronger, a little bit more significant. I'm also liking a lot of my line work, but I don't think it's strong enough so let's strengthen the lines with some red. Nothing I do is permanent. Nothing is set in stone. This can all change and will all change. Um, so I, I really don't want to get precious with anything right now. I want to feel the brush with my body. I want to put my my whole being into the painting. I don't want to hold my brush like a pencil. If you get right up to the painting, like you're writing something, like you would if you were writing a letter or something, <clears throat> that's going to engage the left side of your brain, which is the side you would use if you were writing. And it's going to take you out of the artistic mode and put you in the I'm at work mode, and we really don't want to be there. So um, switch it up, see what happens. Um, now, at this point, I'm looking at the composition. I'm not thrilled with anything here. Still don't like the color scheme. <clears throat> I'm going to shake it up. There we go. Shake it up by moving a panel and see what happens see what happens here. This is, um, this is an area I was going to take out. Now it, it's feeling like it's working a little better. <clears throat> Still very, very, very busy. Now what do you do when your composition is as busy as this and you want to calm it down? <sighs> okay, um, you can continue doing what I was doing with the Titian white and brush it on. You can put collage paper over it to block certain areas off. You can also put uh, pour some paint on top of it and see what you get in that way. I'm going to try that. What I have is house paint now. And I'm gonna, gonna get a little bold and I'm going to pour some house paint on, scrape it across and see what happens. Okay. I've got a big uh, painter spatula. I'm just gonna scrape that through. Actually, maybe something needs to come up through this area so I can scrape into what I just did. Try to reveal something in there. That's kind of an interesting look now. 
trying to find a flow. I love this area and I think it's uh, really getting in my way. So I'm going to take that out partially. Scraping again to get some lines. And you can see the red I had underneath this is kind of flowing in it. Now I'm starting to calm the whole thing down, find a little bit of a composition. There's something about the flow here that's maybe not connecting enough, maybe a little too much space there. And again, this is getting in my way. Now, before I make any more big white uh, house paint moves. I'm going to see what happens. Let's try this. This is interesting. Well, that's that's a, a totally different thing. And I'm actually enjoying that pretty much, giving me some space. Now these, from my perspective, and it's probably upside down for you, seem to be hanging down like a grapes would hang in a bunch. Is that really what I want? Just keep moving it around. Keep moving it until you find something. Eventually, what happens is you, you hit on a composition that feels right. And up until this point, I haven't quite found that yet. Let's do one more turn. Get this one over here. And let's do this. Okay. Okay. It's feeling a little better to me. Love this black that's going across here. And what I really need to do, I want to continue that black either with paper or paint. Trying to open my paint might not work. Okay. Now this is the very, very rough work uh, of, of the painting. This is the real beginning rough in stages. Eventually, I'm gonna find a composition that I'm pleased with, and then I'll start doing the detail work where I can add more colors, more interesting colors, um, tones of what I have already. And then I have to ask myself, do I want to make something that resembles something realistic like branches and fruit? Or do I want to make something totally non-representational? And a lot of times, you know, I'll start out one way and all of a sudden I'll say to myself, this is too representational. And I'll make some marks that will actually make it more abstract. Um, just depending. So... I liked the little bit coming over. I don't like this tail I just put on it. And what I might do, there's a couple of ways you can handle it if you get too much on. You can take a paper towel and wipe it off. I'm gonna to try to scrape it. Let's see what happens. Use the scraper, get off what I don't like. Um, Ask yourself, do you like the gray area that came here? Or would you prefer to white it out a bit? Let's see what happens if I white it out a bit. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it here. Take some of those shapes out. So then these become more dominant, a little more abstracted. These are a little more representational. Gets a little more abstracted over here. Um, it's, it's, all, it's all interesting to keep working back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, 
Don't know where it'll end up. Um, I do see some depth. Can you identify the areas that are in the far background, the mid-ground, and the foreground? We know these red shapes are in the foreground. Red, warm colors really do tend to come forward. Theoretically, that is, it's not always the case. Sometimes they recede into the back. Use your eyes to, to help you determine. I find that this warmer area is, is receding further back than the white area, which is, is on top of that. Um, this would be on top, this receding back. So, you know, we're establishing now that our far background is a warm, yellowish, kind of a beige-ish white. Um, the white is more of a mid-ground. The gray is a mid-ground. The cadmium red is, is very, very close, whereas the, the deeper reds are, are more of a mid-ground also. So... That's how we work with establishing our depth. Just keep going back and forth, back and forth until you feel satisfied with what you have. Some people tell me they are frustrated, they don't like what they see, and they will they'll white over the whole thing. I don't, I don't really recommend that. Traces of what was on surface, even if we cover them up and scrape through them, we have a history of what was there. And it can be pretty interesting. You can manipulate that. Here's a, a brush that I just dipped in water. Can I remove a little bit more of that paint to see what was underneath? Sure. Uh, I'm not gaining too much with that, but uh, you never know. It might have been exciting. I, well, I'm not too thrilled. I'm feeling like I'd like a little something dark in here. Now I have a shape, a black shape, that is kind of floating in that white. It's kind of drifting. And I like that kind of movement. That's an interesting movement and different than the way that most of the painting is moving. Maybe with the exception of this line up here, which does seem to be floating a little. So a floating shape. Um, this is more of a rooted shape. It's coming all the way down to the bottom and it feels more firmly rooted. This is an interesting uh, cluster here. You can't really see, is it, is it hanging down? Uh, the white is obscuring it. In nature, when you see shapes, you see them as impressions of shapes. You're not really seeing definite shapes unless you stop and really closely observe something without moving. But when you're turning your head or driving by in a car or taking a walk, you're getting a glimpse of things in motion and they do blur out. So you might see a cluster of berries on a bush and as you walk by, they're, they're blurring out because maybe they're in the sprinkler and the sprinkler's obscuring them or the conditions of the weather are foggy. Whatever it is, um, you're not going to see a real solid shape. What you can do, and let me get a little different color. I think I'm going to, this is a, a, a more opaque color. This is a red oxide. I'm going to mix it with the cadmium. And I think I'm going to continue some of my red shapes. Another thing I like to do with, say, a red shape, I think that brush is too big for what I want. I'm going to take my old cadmium brush out of the water. Um, in order to make really interesting reds, I may take my reds and I may go over the red with um, orange or pink just to get a little bit 
more of an interesting shade of the red. Now I'm bringing these red shapes into the white to establish a little more of a shape. Shapes are funny things too. I'm attracted to some shapes and other shapes I don't like. So if I make a shape that I don't care for, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to alter it. I'm going to change it until I like the nature of the shape. Still wanting larger shapes, but not necessarily liking the round shape. I like some of these shapes that more resemble a leaf. So maybe I'll put another one in here. Oh, look, that got mixed in with some white. That's neat. Uh, don't know. Don't know about that. See, this all of a sudden came over the top of that. So it pushed this shape in the background, and now I'm building more shapes up here. I could continue doing that. There are some painters that I know that paint with dots, and they've got dots that really recede into the background, and then dots that come, that come forward up to the surface, and it creates this real three-dimensional illusion of floating and moving dots. And I, I happen to love that. So what's starting to happen here is, is interesting to me. This is a little flatter in this area. This feels like it wants a little something brighter to bring it forward, but it's called push and pull. Push and pull, see what happens. And I think I'm at a pretty good stopping point right now. So this is uh, all to be continued. Okay, so that's about it for the painting demonstration. And I hope you enjoyed watching my process and hearing my mental process. It's, it's not something that I can give you, this is step A, this is step B, this is step C. I just make marks. Then I respond to the marks. And hopefully by watching me do it and listening to my mental process, you'll get a little bit of an idea about what goes on in the painter's mind as the painting develops. I don't know in the beginning what the painting will look like. I don't have an idea when I start. I just put paint down and respond to the marks that are there. So I hope this is enlightening to you. I hope you'll stay tuned and subscribe and keep watching. I'll be back, okay? Thanks. Mm -hmm.